you see nebulas, emission and reflection nebulas, but you also see stars and they look brighter and sometimes a different colors. Here, this is, this XR, for example, is dimmer than this one here. So how do we define the luminosity of the star? Which is the goal on this part of the, or this section of this chapter. How do we measure luminosities? Which you probably know I wrote the equation before. How do we measure temperatures? All right. Uh, how do we measure stellar masses? Okay. So if I show you this in physics, that would be like a light bulb, right? But remember, a light bulb, a star like the sun or any star is a black body. It's a perfect black body, right? It emits radiation in a continuous spectrum. And you can use a CCD or a satellite orbiting the Earth to measure the luminosity, which is the, the, ener the energy radiated per meter square per second. That's what we, do, we can do with these guys. So the brightness of a star depends on the distance, how far they are from us, and the luminosity. Luminosity is not really the same as the brightness. The brightness is a factor for luminosity though, which we know that brightness is proportional to the temperature of the star, the surface temperature. So a blue star, which is hotter, will be brighter than the sun. But the sun looks brighter from our perspective because the sun is closer. That's where the distance factor comes into account. So what is the equation? Well, it's basically the equation I wrote you guys before, that luminosity is four pi, but it's not radius square anymore. Now we're looking at how far it is from us. So we plot distance square times, let's put here brightness for now, all right? Brightness in, Radiative physics or radiation physics defined by the Stefan Boltzmann constant times temperature to the power of four. Uh, this one normally goes in here. But for now, let's leave it like that. So the farther I start is, the dimmer it would, it would look, right? Even though the brightness is always the same because it depends on the temperature. The temperature doesn't change with distance, right? What changes is the distance itself. So the reason, for example, a blue giant looks much dimmer than Alpha Centauri is because Alpha Centauri is only 4.2 light years away, while there are blue giants that are hundreds of light years away. Like, for example, the stars in the Orion belt, uh, in the Orion constellation, right? Okay, so where does this 4 pi d square come from? Because basically what you do is you see these lines in here, you can trace a sphere. And this sphere has the radius of the distance. So this is your distance here now, which in the case of the Earth and the Sun is one AU. All right. Uh, now, you remember already from the labs that we talk about the apparent magnitude or apparent brightness. So now we're going to learn what that means and why that is relevant and why we have the apparent and the absolute. The apparent is the amount of light it reaches the earth. But of course, that depends on the distance. The farther the star is, the less light that we get. So the apparent brightness is less, right? Um, however, the absolute brightness depends solely on the intensity, on the temperature of the star. So that's why normally um, the absolute magnitude is proportional to how much brighter a star is, right? Not how apparent it looks. Alpha Centauri, which is a star like the sun, by the way, has roughly the same surface temperature 
uh, they have the same luminosity, right? So which one appears brighter? The sun, because the sun is closer to us. And there it is, right? You can make a, a sphere surrounding the earth and with the center of the star, the farther you are, the luminosity gets uh, smaller. It's called the inverse square factor. So for example, if we double the distance between the earth and the sun, the luminosity will decrease by a power by a factor of four. Right? Um, so that's that's important. There it is. All right. So as you can see, if you double the distance, right, this will refer more to the apparent brightness, okay? Not just brightness. The apparent brightness will decrease by a factor of four, not the absolute brightness. So that's the equation there. Luminosity is four pi d squared times the brightness. Uh, professor? Yeah, okay, so um, regarding the temperature, so the temperature differ, right? Depending on the stars? Yeah. Or, okay, so how does like distance play into account? Because isn't higher temperature equals higher brightness or is it inverse? Higher temperature is higher brightness, of course. Okay. But the, br the brightness mm -hmm. and the luminosity are not exactly the same. The brightness mm -hmm. is will be your absolute brightness. That depends only on the temperature. Mm -hmm. But then you can have the apparent brightness, oh, or okay. in this case, the luminosity, which depends on the distance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. when you guys look in a stellarium at uh, the apparent magnitude, mm -hmm. which is magnitude just by itself in a stellarium, that is the apparent brightness. That's okay. why some stars, like for example, the ones that seem brighter, uh, they have a lower apparent magnitude. But if you go into the absolute magnitude, that's different though, right? In the absolute magnitude, you may actually see that a star that seems dimmer has a lower absolute magnitude because they are actually brighter. It's just that they are farther from us. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. How will the apparent, so that's how I will ask the question as well. So you don't get confused. How will the apparent brightness of Alpha Centauri change if it were three times farther? Here, right? It will only, it will be only one and nine, one over nine as bright because of this equation here. That actually is applied when you talk about the intensity of a light bulb. Um, when you talk about intensity of light in a room, for example, uh, it also follows the inverse square law, by the way. All right, so it's proportional to the distance squared, uh, which intensity will be actually in that case the luminosity. All right, because remember, right, luminosity has a distance of joules energy per meter square per second. Joule per second is power, which is watts. Watts per meter square is the units of intensity, all right? This is the, these are the units of intensity, all right? There you are. So how far are these stars? So there is a way to know that. That's called, there are, okay. For stars that are closer to us, like the sun, obviously, Alpha Centauri, Beta Centauri, right? Um, even with Polaris, uh, you can actually do what we call the method of parallax. Parallax is an apparent shift in position. Look, the best way to describe it is um, when you are looking at a tree that is approximately, let's say 200 meters away, all right? 200 yards, so you kind of 
uh, you can imagine it. And then you cover one of your eyes. You will look at the tree in one position. Then you cover the other eye. What we'll see, you will see an apparent shift of the position of the tree. Now we know that the tree is not moving. So why is that? Because what you're experiencing right now is the effect of parallax. And you can actually be, you can actually be, um, confused by that when you look at the night sky. When you look at the night sky, you see stars that are twinkling, right? Yeah. But there is a moment where they seem to be moving, if uh, apparently. That's also because of the parallax effect. All right. And that's because they are so far that they might seem to be moving, especially when you are. At, that's why you have to be careful when you observe planets, for example. Right. You have to see at the relative motion or position uh, day by day, month by month. So how, how can we measure the parallax? It's an angle. It's an angular shape. In the case of the sun, there are two positions that we can use to determine the parallax of the sun. Uh, during the summer and during the winter, around July and January, you, wanna, you want it to be at, the, at both extremes of the orbit, right? In January, you are approximately in the perihelion. And in January, you are approximately in the aphelion. So you want to basically do this. There. It's not a scale, of course. But by doing that, you can use the sun to look at a nearby star. You see, the sun is a uh, it's your point of reference there. I know it's elliptic, all right, but remember, you can uh, you can like uh, approximate the orbit to be circularish. Plus, this introduces a small error in the angle that you measure here. So that what what is that angle P? Is the angle of parallax? That's why you call it P. This is a right triangle. So there is a nice way to relate one AU, D, and the angle, which is by one over D is the sine of this angle. Now, you don't have to worry about that because in trigonometry, what we know is that when angles like this, which are expected to be very small, less than one degree, we're talking about in the terms of arc seconds or milli arc seconds, right? Uh, then you can measure the sign of this angle as just the angle itself. So you get this equation here. That the distance in parsecs between us and a star, a nearby stars, is one over p. Now, look how it says there that p has to be in arc seconds. And that has to do with how we define parsecs. Now, when we define parsecs, if you remember, was when, forget about this star. I told you, what if we move far away from the sun to the point where the angle, the parallax between this point here and the Earth? is one arc second. So when the angle here is, when that angle is one arc second, that's the label for second, by the way, this distance here is exactly equals to one parsec. And that's exactly, well, almost exactly 3.26 light years. It looks like a random number, but it has to do with this particular uh, property. All right. It's not because there's a star here. It's just that it's a very tiny value for this angle. 
can you go even more than that? Yes, you can, as I said, you can measure angles in milli arc seconds. The smaller the parallax, the larger the distance. That's why there's a limit, right? There's a limit where you cannot measure this angle anymore or you have too much error and uncertainty that this method breaks down. But parallax is the first method in the stellar ladder of galactic distances. We start with parallax, and then we're going to go into something else in a second. But here it is. Is this clear, by the way? You will have a question like that in the exam. I'm not going to ask you to do a crazy calculation, though. I can give you the angle, for example, P equals to 0.5 arc seconds. And then the distance will be one over this, which will be two parsecs. Right? Um, now, that's where we're going to start using parsecs a lot, right? How do you go to light years? The distance in light years will be two times this, will be approximately 6.52, right? Uh, light years. Okay, it's all here. All right. So now we have learned how we measure distances to nearby stars, how we define the brightness, the apparent brightness, and the luminosity. So let's stick with the luminosity, right? Because the luminosity gives you or it involves two um, variables, parameters, the distance and the brightness. So when we measure the luminosity of stars in the universe, we are effectively measuring the luminosity in terms of the luminosity of the sun. Remember, the luminosity of the sun and also the temperature of the sun, but mostly the luminosity of the sun is a point of reference that we use to measure the luminosity of other stars. So that's why we have a million, that's 10 to a 6, times the luminosity. Of so the most luminous stars that we have found in the universe are approximately a million times more luminous. And for stars that are less luminous than the sun, approximately 10 to a negative 4 times the luminosity of the sun. Okay. All right, here it is. So there is a reason why we use apparent magnitudes and absolute magnitudes. Apparent magnitudes is a factor that depends on the apparent brightness. That's your distance there. And absolute magnitude is a measurement of the brightness as well the absolute brightness. So look, the apparent brightness of one star can be measured can be measured respect to the other star using this equation here. Now, this equation doesn't come from nowhere. This is another way that we're gonna use to not just measure brightness of stars or luminosities. Luminosities are with the absolute magnitude, by the way. All right? Apparent brightness, obviously, with the apparent magnitude, okay? So, how do we measure distances with this? With something we call a stellar spectroscopy. Little m minus big M is equal to 5 plus 5 log of distance over 10 parsecs. Now, do you need to use this equation? No. But do you need to know that the distance is proportional to this subtraction? Yes. Because this subtraction sort of relates to this and this, even though here is respect to two stars, so upper magnitudes, absolute magnitudes. This one will be used for one star. 
let's actually open Stellarium. Um, so I can show you what I mean by that. Because in one of the labs, and I will be in the lab with you guys, but in one of the labs, they ask you to just by knowing the apparent and absolute magnitude, how can you tell if a star is less or ten, less or more than 10 parsecs away? So, yeah. The way you know which star, Alpha Centauri, that's four, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's down south. This one here, that's in the, that's one of the pointers to the southern crux there. So, okay. Uh, three, two, that's, uh, okay, that's less than 10 per six, of course. So 4.39 light years, it's approximately 1.1 per six. So that's less than 10 per six. All right. So let's take a look at their absolute magnitude and apparent magnitude. There. The apparent magnitude is 1.2 minus. The absolute magnitude is 5.55. So the apparent magnitude minus the absolute magnitude will give you a negative number. So when you have a negative number in the subtraction of these two values, that means that the star is less than 10 per six away. You know why? Because a way to simplify that equation I show you for one star, for one star only, is apparent minus absolute equals to 10 log of uh, distance over 10. What we know is that Whenever this is negative, that means that the log is negative. The log is negative if D is less than 10. Whenever D is less than 10 parsec, D is in parsecs, that means that this will be negative, like we just did with Alpha and Dowry. Now, let's give you an example with a star that is farther. Um, Antares. Antares is way farther. That's 150 parsecs approximately is the heart of the Scorpio there. There you are. The magnitude is 1.05, which is the apparent magnitude. The absolute magnitude, however, is very small, which means that it's very bright. Makes sense because look, it's a red giant. So you are expecting it to be very luminous, right? Because it has a big radius. Um, If I do 1.05 minus, minus 5.1 will be plus 5.1. So I get a positive value. Whenever you get a positive value in the subtraction, the distance is greater than 10 per six, which there it is. All right. Um, let's take a look at no planets. Uh, let's take a look at the net, which is another bright star in the, that's in the Cygnus constellation. There you are. Its apparent magnitude is 1.25, but that's because it's more than a thousand, around 1400 light years away. The absolute magnitude, however, is very small. It's is smaller than the one of uh, Antares. That means that it's intrinsically brighter, right? So that's the difference. That's why we use both magnitudes, all right? And we have to because we need to put things into our perspective, but that's not fair, right? We also need to analyze, um, how they how they are how luminous they are when you put them from the same distance which is that's what the absolute magnitude does any question
No questions? All right. So now to the real question that you probably are having, right? So this answer is probably not that bad. We have different methods, parallax, spectroscopy. You're gonna learn later the Tully Fisher method, variable stars, uh, Cephi variables. So Doppler effect, right? Like uh, redshift. Awesome, we have ways to measure distances. How do we measure temperatures? I mean, we did a lab, right? The black body radiation lab. So we can analyze the black body spectrum of stars, but we know that they are not perfect. We know that they have gaps. We know that they are absorption lines. So how can we use them into our advantage? Well, each spectral line gives you a lot of information about the atmosphere of a star, as we know already, but also about the activity, which is, the which is related to the temperature of the, of the star, like we did with the sun, and also about the ionization level. The ionization, if you remember, has to do with the energy levels. Emission and absorption, as an electron does, jumps and emits or absorbs a photon. Every object, as you know, emits thermal radiation. That's what we use the black body curve. With a spectrum that depends on its temperature. Yes, Dion's law, right? Lambda times temperature equals to 0 0.0029 Kelvin's meter. We have a relationship there. So an object of fixed size grows more luminous as the temperature increases. So that makes sense, right? You can have two balloons or two light bulbs uh, one will be brighter if the temperature of the other one is, is higher than the other. That makes sense. So what are the properties of thermal radiation? Hotter objects emit more light per unit area at all frequencies. We remember that from black body cure, from the Planck cure. And as we expect, blue stars are hotter and they will emit higher energy photons than a star like the sun. Right? Not just because it's bigger, but because it's hotter. More, the hotter it is, the more energy, the more ionization, the, en the more energy. The Remember this equation, guys, when I talk about that, energy of a photon is equal to the Planck constant times the frequency. Right, and we know that the larger the frequency, the more the energy. And what do we know about the wavelengths? The shorter the wavelength, which is more to the blue, bluish. Okay. All right, so. We have been able to measure with the black body curve and with the spectral lines, we're able to measure or compute some stellar temperatures. And we have a range between 50,000 and 3,000. So remember, we now have a luminosity range and a temperature range. So there has to be a way that we can classify all these guys, right? Because if not, it will be a mess. Sort of like what we do in chemistry, right? We have a lot of atomic masses, atomic numbers, but they will be meaningless if we didn't have a way to put them in the periodic table, right? So it's similar to what's gonna happen with the stars later, all right? The level of ionization also reveals a star's temperature. Uh, remember guys, that when we talk about, um, ah, phases of matter, states of matter, we spoke on how when you increase the temperature, you are increasing the average kinetic energy of particles. And then when you go from one state to another, for example, when you uh, melt ice, when you vaporize water, when you go beyond the gaseous state into plasma, 
you are breaking the bonds between particles, the intermolecular bonds. So in that case, we have to start talking about what? We have to talk, start talking about the potential energy between particles. So the ionization has to do with that, all right? So a higher ionization, a higher, reveals a higher temperature. Okay, just as you see in this graph here. Um, and of course, the more ionization, the more information those spectral lines will reveal. And the thing is, we can measure those spectral lines because we can use spectrometers in our um, telescopes. Like for example, the James Webb telescope, that's what it will have as well, right? Um, okay. There it is. We did that in one of the labs, right? But I didn't really ex fully explain how, do, how does that spectral type or classification comes from. Now you know. The spectral classification comes from the spectral lines, which corresponds to the stellar temperature of these stars. You go from O to M. O is the hottest, M is the coolest. You're probably wondering, where is the sun located? Well, the sun is located around the middle towards the cool side. The sun is a G spectral type star. However, it's not that cool. It's almost 6,000 kelvins. So it's a G2 star. And it's a G2V because it's a main sequence star, which we are going to learn also today. All right. So the star is a young star, medium, relatively medium size, uh, warmish star. It's an average star. It's your average star. All right. And believe it or not, those are the stars that we should be looking at. Uh, you can also make the claim. You can also claim that we should look into red dwarfs, which uh, we will talk also uh, uh, during this course. To, to find planets or exoplanets with the possibility of life. The problem with giants, as we will learn as well, is that they have a very short uh, lifetime, right? The sun has 10 billion years, the, right? We know that, but the star like Antares, Betelgeuse, Rigel, the giants, they have a time span that can go tops millions of years, one to million years, right? So that's not enough for life to evolve, right? I mean, we as humans have evolved for at least 5 million years, uh, 3.5 5 million years, right? So that wouldn't be enough. Okay, don't quote me on this memotechnic rule, by the way. I don't think you guys need it, all right? But there you are, okay? Um, what type of question can I ask you in exam or you will see in a lab? Which star will be the hottest, a B star or a K star? Right, so that's why you need to remember at least the order. From left to right, the hotter and the cooler star. Which star is the hottest? A, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. So there, all right. Simple. But still, that's just the spectral type. It doesn't reveal too much about the star itself. It tells you the temperature already. That's good. But if you remember from that lab, the black body lab, uh, we had to also find the number, right? That was next to it, because that will tell you more accurately the temperature of the star. Okay. So just a little bit of history, guys. So just so, just so you guys know. Um, who has watched the movie Hidden uh, Hidden Figures? So that has happened through history a lot. All right. If you don't do your research properly, you wouldn't know about any jump cannon or different scientists that were behind the scenes doing what they call here calculations for modern stellar classification. If you guys watch the movie Hidden Figures, 
you or read a book because it's based on a book, you will learn that um, behind all those calculations to get to the moon, there were a group of three women and they made a whole bunch of calculations to make possible for us to, or make possible for um, humans to launch the um, Apollo to the moon. You're basically like right? calculators. <laughs> Yeah, basically, because remember, we didn't have calculators back then, right? Uh, and that's what happened also in this time. Right? So there you are. Okay. Um, before we go into fully on classification of stars, let's talk a little bit about stellar masses because we have spoken about... Um, luminosity, brightness, apparent brightness, temperature, but stellar masses are also very important to classify stars, all right? So it's difficult when you have systems like our solar system, because you only have planets orbiting the sun. Now, because we are basically next to the sun, we can use the Earth or other planets and Kepler laws to determine the mass of the, the sun, right? You, we, if you know the period and the distance, you can find it by using Kepler's third law. Well, Newton's version of Kepler's third law. Um, what about stars that are farther away from our planet, from our solar system? Normally, it's very tricky unless you're looking at what we call a binary system. A binary system is made of, a, made of two stars orbiting each other. A good example would be Sirius A, Sirius B, which consists of a, two stars orbiting about a common center of mass. Okay, what do I mean about a center of mass? If you have, oh, actually I talked about this before, right? But let's recall this again. So does that mean there's two stars for the Sirius? Yeah, Sirius A, Sirius B. Sirius A is the main sequence, large star. Sirius B is a white dwarf. Okay. And what you see normally is you see that the orbits um, are affected by one, by one another, but also because at some point Sirius B stars a white dwarf is a very dense point in, uh, in space. It's when a star like the sun collapses and dies. So when Sirius A gets closer to Sirius B because of the gravitational interaction, uh, part of the gas is being sucked towards Sirius B. And you can create a small accretion disk. It's not a black hole. But what happens sometimes is that you get a nova. A nova is the re-emission of a white dwarf. And it can be very, very luminous. It's actually what we call a supernova type one, which we'll learn as well. Okay, so if you have two masses and this mass is way bigger than this, then you can assume that the center of mass is around here, right? That's what we assume for the solar system, by the way, that the mass of the sun is so large in comparison with the mass of the other planets, that you can assume perfectly that the center of mass is on the sun. When you analyze, especially if you analyze a, a planet and the sun individually. But when you have two stars, that's not the case anymore. You can have a star one here, and you can have a star two. Yes, a star one may be larger than this, and more massive, but it's not much, much more massive than this. So a center of mass might be a point in the middle. the point will be closer to the more massive. And they will orbit around this point. This can orbit around like this. And this can orbit around like this. All right. So there is a point where because of the orbit, if I project this into the plane, 
that they might look like this. That the star might produce like an eclipse on a star A. A star A and a star B, you can visualize them there. But when a star B is in front, like the moon and the earth and the sun, right? When we talk about the eclipses, sort of like that. So you see all the luminosity from B, but not from A. Then you can see them again. And then you don't see B again. So what, can, what kind of information can we get from a binary system? A lot. We can get the period of motion of a star B because you see you have these bumps. So you can calculate how long it takes for a star to go from this position to this position. That's half the orbit. Times two, that's the whole period. Easy. Then we can also calculate the masses because if I have the period and I have the relative distance between one and the other, which I can, by the way, because if I know the time it takes for this star to go behind this, I can tell the distance. Distance equals speed over time. The speed information gets to us is speed of light. So we can know. We, by the way, that's one of the methods that we use to measure the speed of light. We use the ecliptic method of the moons of Jupiter. So that's good, we can use that. So if we have the, the distance between the stars and we have the period of motion, we can use Kepler's laws. Let's just keep all this for now. And we can use this equation here. Ooh, nice, right? So this was Kepler's equation. We have the period, we have the distance, we can find the mass. Um, remember, since we're measuring from the Earth, we have to call it the apparent brightness, okay? And this obviously is time. What other things can we measure with an ecliptic binary? All right. Uh, another example of a binary system will be Meiser and Alcott, by the way. Uh, those stars are in the Ursa Minor. Uh, let me remember exactly because that was something I didn't know since I was, I believe. Wait, four, five, six, seven, right? Don't tell me it's not that one. Oh, what is the Ursa Mayor? My bad. It was the Ursa Mayor. So the Ursa Mayor also has seven stars, you see? I got confused. So in the Ursa Mayor, Alcor and Miser. There you are. You see this? Let's highlight it. This is Ursa Mayor there. And that, that's another binary system here. All right. There. It's hard to watch, though. It's hard to observe. You have to use a telescope for it. All right. So there it is. Um, of course, the motion of this orbit depends on gravity, right? Um, as we saw from that equation that I showed you already, the Kepler's loss equation. Now, we have different types of binary system. We have the visual, spectroscopic, and eclipsing binary. That one there. So, what is an spectro spectroscopic binary system? Can somebody guess? Okay. Let's remember Doppler effect and spectral lines. What will happen with a binary system where the star is moving towards us relative to the other star, right? So between this point and this point, right? When the star is coming to us, what will be noticed? <clears throat> What we will notice is that the spectral lines are gonna be shifted, are gonna be blue shifted 
because they is moving towards us with respect to the other star. But in this point, the star is moving away. The spectral lines will be redshifted. If you can measure the difference on the shift, you can actually have a nice uh, spectrum of the binary system. That's what we call it spectroscopic binary. All right. Do you know what's interesting is that based on observations in the night sky, about half of the stars are in binary systems. Remember, binary system doesn't mean just two main sequence stars like the sun or Alpha and Beta Centauri. But also Sirius A and Sirius B, you can also consider them as a binary system. Okay. Um, and then with a visual binary, it's a binary system that you don't see them eclipsing anyway. They never eclipse each other. They move relative to the other one. All right. If you were in a planet looking at this, it will look exactly as the sunset in Tatooine. And I hope you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Right? Classic sea of twin suns. Heck yeah. Yeah, it will look exactly like because they don't really cover, they don't really go on top of each other. Right? They, what's they that movie? A, huh? I said, what's that movie? Uh, it's Star Wars A New Hope. The, the twin sons. I was sons. joking. <laughs> I was being sarcastic. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's a binary system. And the Luke when Luke. George Lucas did this movie, right? First of all, he, he didn't know for sure that this could be true, which it could be true. One star can be reddish and the other one can be whitish, right? This could be a red dwarf. This could be a main sequence star. That's fine. The other thing that he wasn't sure was that binary systems were very common. Actually, he, he was sort of lucky and right. Binary systems are common and actually, yes, there could be life in a binary system, right? It will not be the same as it shows in the movie, maybe, but there could be life, yes. Uh, it depends on the stability of the planet as it orbits the system. Anyway. Uh, here is your spectroscopy binary. It has to do with the lines. Either they are red shifted or blue shifted. So it's based on the Doppler shifts of the spectral lines. All right. And here is your eclipsing binary. We use eclipsing binary to measure, and we can measure those periodic eclipses. And then with that, we can measure the period, the distance, and the mass. All right, using this equation here. Are there any questions? Remember guys that we can find the orbital velocity if we have the period. And if we know the distance between the stars, the orbital velocity is two pi r divided. Again, yes, we are assuming that these are circular orbits. So there are always some sorts of errors. Uh, that is a really good approximation regardless, okay? So when we look at binary systems, what we have found is that we can find stars up to 100 times the mass of the sun and about 8% the mass of the sun. So we have now four parameters. What are those? Okay, let's ask you a question. What are the four parameters that we have so far to start talking about stars as a whole? What was the first item we spoke about? Temperature. Good, that's one. What's the other one? What's the first one we talk about? Was it luminosity? Luminosity, good. And what are the last two? One of them is here. 
The mass, right? The mass. The other one is hidden inside this, which is the size, the radius of the star. Okay. What have we learned? Luminosities, brightness, apparent brightness, apparent magnitudes and absolute magnitudes. How we use them to find distances, all that. What's the difference between one and the other? How do we measure temperatures? Spectral lines, the classification of stars. See here, no, OVA, FGKM. And then how do we measure stellar masses with the binary systems? All right. Okay. There are some patterns that we have identified. Just like in the periodic table, we have groups and periods. We have them arranged by the atomic number. We have atomic masses. We have electronic configuration. We have all that. For a start, we have something similar. We have what we call the Hermsburg Russell diagram. This is a very important and one of the most significant results for stellar evolution and for this chapter and the upcoming chapters, by the way. Because this is where we locate stars from the universe based on what? Based on this, giants, supergiants, main sequence and white dwarfs. Those are the classifications or groups. So what properties do we use? Well, uh, we just talk about it. Let me show you this diagram here. Oh, okay, there it is. See. There it is. All right, guys. On the y-axis, we plot the luminosity of a star. And as I said at the beginning of the lecture, luminosity is always in terms of the luminosity of the sun, because if not, you will have crazy numbers here. So one is the luminosity of the sun. Yeah. 10 times more luminous, 100 times, 1,000 more. So. Then we have the temperature. But guess what? We have been able to classify stars based on the temperature. So we have O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And we can also put the temperature values there as a reference. The temperature increases from right to left, just like the stellar type or the spectral type. The luminosity goes from, there is just a problem though. <laughs> Here is where you guys are gonna be kind of a, the absolute magnitude, we can also put in this here, you see that there is an empty axis here. We can put here the absolute magnitude. And how do we put the absolute magnitude here? Easy. You go from five, four, three, two, one, zero, negative one. So yeah, the first thing is that this is gonna be against what you guys did in algebra, right? The negative numbers are above, the positive numbers are below. Why is that? Can somebody tell me why in astronomy we use the scale like this? For absolute magnitudes. And please, I want you to remember what we discussed about it, so. All right, the lower the magnitude, the higher the luminosity, right? The absolute magnitude. So the lower it is, the higher the luminosity. That's why it's written like that. Make sense? Okay. Yeah, thanks. What is this cure that you see here? This is the main sequence cure. 70% of time, or, or, or uh, seven out of 10 times when you look at a star, it will fall in this cure, in this line. 
here, in the main sequence here. The sign is around the middle there, here. The sign is determined by a temperature of Should be around here, put a one one there, 5,800, and the luminosity of one. There can be cooler stars like the, than the sun. Proxima Centauri is one of them. There. There can be hotter stars. Mm -hmm. But as you go up, what also increments? What also increases as you go up? The luminosity. So a star that is around here or here, they are called the giant main sequences or the blue giants. These stars are very massive main sequence stars that are very hot and that will burn their fuel much more rapidly than the sun. For the stars that are around the neighborhood of the sun, talking about stars around here, they will have a life a lifetime of eight to 10 billion years. As you go up, look at the lifetime. 10 million, 100 million. Here you start getting to a billion, 10 billion. Again, 10 million, 100 million, a billion, a thousand millions, and 10 billion years. However, as you go down here, the lifetime gets larger and larger. In fact, we now know that red dwarfs, which are at the tail of the main sequence, they can have life times that will supersede the age of the universe. In other words, they have lifetimes in the trillions of years, a thousand billions. That's what I said. If you wanna look for planets that might be able to, to host life, not just intelligent life, but life, you may wanna start looking into planets orbiting red dwarfs. So I had a question. Um, so they're not gonna um, like they're not gonna change colors slowly over over time, right? No. 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 They what happens, for example, with the sun, because with the red dwarfs it's difficult to say right now because they will stay like that for trillions of years, right? Because of the rate of the rate of fusion in the core. As you remember with the sun, I said, what happens is the rate of fusion increases. The core expands. What happens if it decreases? The core shrinks and it becomes redder. Voila, that's why you have the red dwarfs in that. Um, but however, what happens with the sun though? Will the sun always be like, well, we know it's white, but let's say it's yellow, right? Will the sun always look yellow? No. In approximately 5 billion years, the 90% plus of the hydrogen in the core of the sun will be depleted. And you will have a core of helium with, an, with, a, hydrogen, with a hydrogen shell surrounding it. You won't have enough pressure and temperature to burn helium. So the core will collapse by its own gravity. However, the sun will start, the core will start to shrink the outer layers will start to expand. So the sun will start to become bigger and bigger. I'm talking about the outer shells. At some point, the pressure and temperature will reach the values to burn hydrogen. It won't start immediately. There will be something called a helium flash approximately around this point. And then it will reach a point around here. It will become a red giant. And it will start, burn, it will start burning helium into carbon. Okay. But that, what was that? So a blue giant would never turn to white or yellow or even uh, No, actually it would. A blue giant, okay, 
Let me finish with this. Yeah. So, uh, the sun, once it's a red giant, it will stay there. It won't have enough temperature to burn carbon into nitrogen and oxygen. So it will die into a white dwarf. And we know white dwarfs also have long, long lifetimes. We believe that after a white dwarf, um, let's say, dies, it becomes a black star or a black dwarf. But that's more theoretical. We haven't seen one yet. Okay, let's go into your giants now. Now that's going ahead. That's not gonna be, that's not really in this chapter, but so you know, with a giant, like for example, a Spica, it will eventually collapse and it will become a super giant, but it will be doing this. It will do like a cycle in the super giant region. This cycle shows you how the temperature and luminosity will fluctuate as it burns hydrogen to helium, helium to carbon, carbon to nitrogen, nitrogen to oxygen, so on, so on, so on, until iron. When it reaches iron, no more energy can be produced. So it will die into what? Not a white dwarf. It will die into a supernova. The process for a blue giant or a giant star to become a super giant and start being a super red giant, like for example, Antares and Betelgeuse, is more smoothly than the process of the sun going from main sequence to giant. Because these stars have enough mass and fuel to just go from this stage to this stage. Okay. And so does that mean that you, the lifetime decreases the hotter the star is? Yep, of they course, because faster. the hotter the star is, the more ionization, the more fusion reactions are happening, the more you have nuclear reaction rate, the, the higher the rates of fusion, the higher, the, the faster the hydrogen will deplete. Okay. So that means that it will run out of fuel much faster. That makes sense. All right. Um, okay. Luminosity, temperature and classification. Can somebody tell me what are these diagonals that you see here? This one, this one, this one. Those are what we call solar radius. Since we cannot put another axis, right, because we already used luminosity, magnitude, and temperature, um, we found a way to classify stars also by using their sizes. And that's what we use these diagonal lines. As you can see, the sun goes through the line that has one solar radius. So why is this important now? You know why? Because a star the size of the sun can also be extremely hot, right? Uh, it can be around what? 50,000 Kelvins? But it doesn't matter that it can get super hot. It will never reach the luminosity of a giant <laughs> because it's not big enough. So the luminosity, as you know already, of a star depends on the size of the star and the temperature of the star. How about um, a star that is 10 times the size of the sun? Well, there you are. A star that is 10 times the size of the sun can be a giant. It will just need to be way, way, way more hotter. The temperature of the sun is approximately 6,000 Kelvins. Here we're talking about 50,000 Kelvins. We're talking about eight times larger in terms of temperature. All right. Actually, guys, there's three labs on this now, I remember. Because the first lab that we're going to do is the motion of the stars. That's a very easy lab. 
Then we're going to do a lab on light classification magnitudes. And then we have a lab about the H and R diagram. So you're going to have a lab where you're going to classify stars. That lab is going to be very long. So I have to figure it out when in April we're going to do it because that's probably going to take like two hours. But you're going to learn a lot in that lab because that's when you're going to learn how these stars evolve and, you know, um, that's more chapter 16. So that makes sense. That's why it's probably for later. Okay. So this is a more clear image because here we're focusing on the main sequence. I want you to remember how this curve looks. I want you to remember how do we locate the sun? Luminosity one, temperature 5,800, 6,000, approximately here. It's a G star. Okay, there. Red, red dwarfs, red giants as well, are normally classified with K and M types. As you go farther in the classification, F, A, B, J, A, O, you go into hotter stars. And the luminosity as well gives you a clue of that. And look at that change on timelines, right? Or lifetimes. That's important there. Uh, more stars falling in the main sequence. It starts with lower, okay. It starts with lower temperature and higher luminosity. Normally half are, okay, so that's important there. Let's go back to this. You can have a star that is very cool, 4,000 Kelvin, approximately here. But they are not necessarily in this section. They can be giant stars. So where do they fall? They will fall here, right? Aldebaran is an example. It's cooler than the sun, but it's bigger than the sun. And because it's bigger than the sun, it's more luminous than the sun. Can you already see how things start coming together? Right? So size matters, not just temperature. Okay. Now you can have a star that is, say, uh, here. Look at this star here. This star here is smaller than Aldebaran, but it's brighter. Not much brighter, but brighter because it has a higher temperature. Now, let me show you how you read these radiuses as well, because you're going to need it for later. It's not as simple as one, two, three. Point one, then it, jumps, then it does a jump of one. Then from one, it does a jump to 10. So it multiplies by 10. So, huh? how, how are those giants, like if the rule of thumb for the majority of the stars is the hotter it gets, the larger it gets in size, why are they exceptions? Is there something yeah. in the birth of it? Here, because these ones are giants, are the second, are part of the evolution of a main sequence. So a main sequence becomes a giant. Okay. And then it, they are they die into a, a white dwarf. Okay. So the reason why they become larger is because the outer envelopes, we're talking about the convective zone in this case, the photosphere and the convective zone, they all get like a balloon. They, they get inflated. A lot of the stellar gas is lost to the space. It's expelled. But then, since the star is getting larger and expanding, for example, the sun, when it becomes a red giant, it will expand until the orbit of the Earth, so one AU. So because of that expansion, it will become more reddish because the expansion will make that surface temperature decrease. But because it's becoming much, much bigger in terms of size, it will become more luminous, even though it's a... Uh, lower temperature. But the thing is that it's, ten it's more than 10 times bigger. But it's only about 2,000 Kelvins less. 
of Temperatur. All right. And now, I'm sorry if you did explain this already, like what's the difference between the giant and then the red supergiant? The red supergiant are the after evolution of a giant star, a star okay. that is in this part. So same process, the large, like, um, so one of those large blue giants will then turn into a large red giant and then eventually turn in, and then you'll have the supernova. Okay. Exactly. You got it. Very good. And the thing is that the question, though, that you probably are asking or wondering as well, what makes a star fall into this category or this category or this category? I cannot really answer that question now but I will give you a glimpse. How the, well, you remember in the video that I showed in the previous chapter, the sun was formed from a solar nebula, right? Mm -hmm. A disk of gas that collapsed, contract. Well, it's not just that the sun magically appears. There is a proto star forming in there. Once the disk is formed, there is no nuclear fusion. There needs to be a dress hole pressure and temperature for that to happen. Once it reaches that point, you start fusing hydrogen into helium. However, proto stars are not always from the same size. We normally don't use the HR diagram for them, but you can have a proto star around here. They can be large, by the way, or here or here. And the thing is that depending on the subsequent evolution, they can fall into this point, or they can fall into this point, or they can fall into this point. And from that point, they become main sequences. When they start burning hydrogen, we will talk about the processes in between here, and also in between the disk and a protostar. There is billions of years in between, by the way, a lot of time. But it's very exciting because that tells you that it's like going into the prehistory of the sun, right? We look at the history of the sun, but we can go into the past and what happened before it was the sun. So proto stars that are large enough, they can go into this and then they become main sequences, but large main sequences, giant main sequences. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we talk about this. The classifications are important. Main sequence, giant, super giants, white dwarfs. There are different main sequences. You can have giant, medium size, small ones you can say, and dwarf main sequences, red dwarfs. Uh, Okay, we talk about that, we talk about that. So there you are, guys, G2V. The star is a G2V star. A spectral type G, temperature 2, uh, classification V, main sequence. Sirius A is an A star, hotter than the sun, temperature 1, main sequence. It's a hotter main sequence. Betelgeuse, a red giant, is an M star to super, it's a red super giant, actually. Oh, yeah, it's a red super giant. I get confused with um, Aldebaran. Anyway. So in the HNR diagram, we can also depict color, spectral type, and luminosity, and radiuses. We can, have a, we can get a lot of information from these guys. All right, this is a question I can ask in a... Uh, no, we're not going to have a quiz on this, right? So I can ask you a question like that in the exam. That's too easy, though. Which star is the hottest? By the way, yeah, can you answer that question? A, B, C, or D? Which star is the hottest? Man, guys, that's easy. Just look at the, at the axis. 
Let's see. Yeah, no, that will be biggest. The C will be the most luminous and the largest. Oh, I'm sorry. You said, oh, hottest. So that yeah. would be A. That would be A. Yeah, what? I was feeling A. Like, a. I'm fighting like the internal, like that natural. I was looking at that, luminosity. Like, That's right. Sorry. Like, uh, the redder it is, the hotter it is. When no, it's the opposite in space. It's all, it's all, no, wait, 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 wait. It's also the same on Earth. If I give you a candle, which is the hottest part? I mean, like, the usual perception is yeah. red is hot. <laughs> hot. It's still, like, a thing here on Earth. It's just, like, the natural human thought is red is hot. I guess so. Um, however, when I was... Do you guys ever, in chemistry... Uh, it's a bit, it's not dangerous, but you have to do it with a Bunsen burner. Um, when I was in school, remember that? Yeah, you put well, a piece of iron oh, in a blue, Bunsen burner. Purple, yeah. It would become white at the end, right? You remember that? Yeah. Okay, there you are. That's because the hottest part will be when it gets white each. In a candle, Uh, actually, the hottest part is the white part. This one here. At the very bottom, you see the white part. The blue part is normally the hottest in the so But it's, it's true. Middle, it's, the bottom. Huh? it's not the middle. The middle looks white of the candle. No, the the hottest part will be here where I'm pointing. Okay. Okay, okay. All right, we should start with the most luminous. Should see. What do you see? Which star will be the smallest? G? No. Uh, no, it would be A. Because mm. is it Look a at the red Yeah, on the. This is. Yeah. Then. 10 times the size of the sun, the size of the sun, 10%, 0 0.1, the size of the sun, this is 0 0.01. So then it's A, right? Mm -hmm. Because the axes are going diagonal. Yeah. Very important to know how to read the radiuses as well, okay? Okay, we did that. All right. Which star is in the main sequence? That's D. Very good. D. What classification will be B? A bright star or something? It can be either a main sequence, a giant, super giant, or white dwarf. So what's B? Oh, okay. So, uh, mm, super giant? Yeah. Yeah. What about A? That would be a white dwarf. It's a white dwarf. That's the thing about white dwarfs. They are very, very hot, but because they are very, very small, the luminosity is less than the sun, for example. Oh, I didn't see that. I didn't know there was planets there. Actual uh -huh. small planets. I just saw the the um the like the oval shape. No, these are yeah. by the way, these are not white. These are not planets. These are white dwarfs. These are basically the leftovers of a low massive star when it dies. I didn't see that though. The little circles on there. Okay. Ah. They're so small. Yep. All right. Which star has the largest radius? C. Which one? C. C. And the smallest one, A. What is the significance of the main sequence? That's where most of the stars lay, lay uh, that's where most of the stars lay around. That's where you will find most of the stars. That's where you will find uh, the most common type of classification. When you look for a, a star, they can be different sizes, all right? And it makes sense because when you go into giants and super giants, the lifetime is much, much shorter. 
than a mean sequence. Okay. Okay. A main sequence is always fusing hydrogen into helium. It doesn't matter if you're talking about a blue giant, a G star like the sun, or a red dwarf. The difference is the rate of fusion. The higher it fuses, the shortest the lifetime, which is what happens with the blue giants six to 60 times the mass of the sun, as you can see in the diagram. The luminosity goes always upwards. So that, right, that makes sense. So obviously the red stars are here, the blue stars are here. Also, when you look at the mass measurements and the size measurements, the radius, you will see that the blue giants are much more massive than the stars like the sun or the red dwarfs. Because they are more massive, they will become super, red, super giants in part of their evolution. And they will never die into a white dwarf. They will not collapse. They will burn different elements in their core until they die into an explosion a big explosion called or known as a supernova. I had a question. Um, yeah. So for you said like the red dwarf, the, the red uh, dwarfs, are those born at that size you said, or was that just the evolution of a star? No, they are, when the protos, when the proto sun is formed, they start burning hydrogen into helium at this lowest threshold. So there is a, minimum amount of energy required, temperature and size for that to happen. Red dwarf is the lower limit. You probably okay, have heard so about a brown dwarf. How many of you have heard about a brown dwarf? Brown dwarf, that rings a bell. A brown dwarf, is also known as a failed star. Just in case Jupiter is not a brown dwarf. All right, it was thought to be a brown dwarf, but look at that size differences. All right, we're talking about approximately 80 times more massive than Jupiter. But what is the characteristic of a brown dwarf? Why do we call it a failed star? Because it was about to be a star but it didn't reach the enough mass to become or to start fusing hydrogen into helium. It didn't reach the pressure and the temperature of 10 to 15 million kelvins to start fusion reactions. Hence, brown dwarf. They are very large, much more larger than any planet, as you can see in the diagram there. Look at the size of the Earth. Look at the size of Jupiter. Just yeah, so I give you a scale. You see the red spot of Jupiter there? You see it? Yeah. About three times or about three Earths can fit in there. In that one spot? Yeah. Wow. And then you have a brown dwarf, which is much bigger than this guy. And then you have, look at the comparison with the sun. A red dwarf will be mm, a bit smaller, bigger than a brown dwarf though. So a brown dwarf is a failed star, yes. Um, and they will be approximately here in the very tail of the main sequence. We normally don't plot them in here because they are not stars, okay? So, Professor, I have a question about the um, the fusing hydrogen to helium. Um, does it, so, like, is it the higher you go, the faster the rate is? Like, if you're going up towards, like, the blue and then, like, down towards the red, is it lower? Like, how does yeah, that? Yeah, you got it. The oh. rate of fusion that we talk about when we spoke about, when remember when we talk about the sun, we talk about the rate of fusion, right? Mm-hmm. 
So yes, the bluish star, the higher the rate of fusion. Okay, and they're dying, that, so cause, because they're dying out faster. Yes, that's why they have, look, these leaves, uh, three, order of, three orders of magnitude more times than this, right? We're talking about a thousand times more lifetime. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I got the, the fusion correctly. Okay, thank you. Well, this makes sense. The rate of hydrogen burning will determine the luminosity and the spectral type, right? Because that gives you the luminosity and the temperature of the star. The hotter it is, the blue it is, and the classification will be around OB for blue stars. For white stars, AF. For yellow stars, G, K, -ish. M stars will be red. So we know this from the previous chapter, we need to have enough core pressure given by nuclear reactions to balance the enormous amount of gravity. So let me ask you a question. If you have a mass, which is 60 times the mass of the sun, it makes sense that you need more pressure. Therefore, you need more powerful and more, and a higher rate of nuclear fusion happening in the core of giants to balance gravity, right? This also answers the question on why red giants, why red giants and super red giants, of course, have a much shorter lifetime than the corresponding main sequence. For example, uh, the life of the sun as the main sequence is 10 billion years, right? Well, the life of the sun as a red giant won't go beyond millions of years, probably not even a million. Because it will need to burn helium into carbon way, way faster than what it's doing for hydrogen to helium to balance the enormous amount of pressure. That's basically what it says in this paragraph. So these are some of the properties in that diagram from 10 to a negative four to a million times from 3000 to 50,000. And uh, then in terms of the masses, okay. And there is a relationship guys between the luminosity and the masses, right? It makes sense. The more masses, the, no, the more luminous, the shorter the lifespan the less mass, the less temperature as well. So that's why you have red dwarfs. Proxima Centauri is a good example. And the higher the mass, the higher the temperature. Remember guys, these are all surface temperatures. We know, for example, in the sun, the surface temperature of the sun is 5,800 Kelvins, but the core temperature is approximately 15 million Kelvins, right? We know that. 10%, yeah, that's about right. The sun's life expectancy depends on how much or until it burns 90% of the hydrogen in the core. At that point, it will start to collapse. Uh, the thing is that uh, just like a candle, I don't know if you have ever heard this phrase, but a candle will start burning brighter and brighter when it's about to die. The same happens with the sun. When the sun starts getting to, draw to that limit value, that's when the sun will start burning and getting brighter. And that's when the sun will start going into that giant region, right? Will start to, will start to expand, to collapse and expand. Well, Professor, is that true, is that true for all stars then, that yes. over time? Yes, so every star will collapse. The difference is on how they collapse. A star like the sun will have a more chaotic and a slow process of collapsation. Is that a word? Collapsing, right? But a giant star, like for example, uh, Sirius A or Deneb, right? Or Rigel, which are blue giants, will 
go into the super giant region more smoothly. They won't have, and you will learn what I'm talking about, they won't have the helium flash event. Uh, it starts like the sun, and it didn't, I didn't show you that here, but when we talk about stellar evolution, there is a subsection here. Let me see if I remember it correctly. Yeah, it's a heaven glitch, but it goes around here. It reaches a point that we call the horizontal branch. And then it gets a boost and gets into a giant region here. This boost is when the helium flash happens, which is the chaotic beginning of burning of helium. So that's and when then, it becomes brighter in that, in that moment? Yeah, you see? Okay. Yeah, of course. Almost exponential, look how much it increases. Okay. So what we have seen is that if you have 10 times the mass of the sun, you will use it 10 to the four times as fast. You can even see it here in the diagram. Look. If you have 10 times the mass of the sun, the luminosity is 10 times 10 to the four, right? So you are outputting 10,000 times more energy than, uh, than the sun, just when the mass is 10 times bigger. If it's 60 times bigger, you are, you are outputting a million times more. So there is that. And we know how those nuclear reactions work, right? Based on the previous in the chapter on the sun. Of course, it happens also the other way around. If you have 10% of the mass of the sun, then you start doing it 10 to a negative two times as fast in terms of the luminosity, right? So look at the life expectancy of a mass that is only, of a star that is only 10% the mass of the sun, 100 billion years. That's here. Imagine the time here. That's when you start going to the trillion years for red dwarfs. All right, they have a very long lifetime, very stable. Any questions, guys? So that is a summary with a few examples. A B star, Spica, blue giant, High luminosity, high mass, very short lived, large radius, blue. Uh, low mass, like our sun, right? Low luminosity, long lived, small radius, yellow or red. I have a question. Um, yeah? So for stars on that main sequence, they all, um, did you say they all turn white when they're going to die eventually or? No, um, when all the stars in the main sequence, will become giants or super giants. Okay. After the main sequence. Okay. I start like okay. a speaker. Yeah. I start like a speaker will remain in the super giant region for quite a while. Like when I say quite a while, I'm talking uh, in different stages until it collapses into a supernova. The sun, however, it will never reach to be a super giant, but it will reach to be a giant a red giant, and then it will stay there for maybe a million years, and then it will die into a white one. Okay. Um, so, like, when they become, so, like, how some of the super giants are red, and then some are blue, mm -hmm. is that just the evolution of the super giant, or is that because the uh, lower stars on that main sequence were redder? No, the reason is because the blue giants they become super red giants when hydrogen runs out in their core. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Yes. Okay, thanks. Oh, there it is. What are giants, super giants, white dwarfs? So if I show you this picture, right, could you try and guess which is a giant and a super giant here? Or a main sequence even? I could say maybe these two are giants. Maybe this is a red supergiant. 
This could be a blue iron. This could be a main sequence. Again, it's very relative, right? Because that's the apparent, right? We will have to look at their absolute magnitude. But just by looking, you could start guessing what type of stars they are based on their color, based on their luminosity, based on their sizes. So let me give you a perspective. So that's the sun, right? Look at the Earth comparison. Look at the white dwarf comparison. The thing about a white dwarf, a white dwarf can be the size of a planet, but it's much, much, much hotter than the sun. A white dwarf can be the size of the Earth with a temperature of 30,000 kelvins, six times the temperature five times the temperature of the sun. But then we're going to Aldebaran, a red giant cooler than the sun, bigger than the sun, therefore much more luminous than the sun. 44 times bigger than the sun, so it's not a scale, of course. But then you can go into a super giant, which is cooler than the giant but it has 120,000 times the luminosity because it's almost a thousand times the, so the radius of the sun. All right. Size matters, right? So that's why in that H and R diagram, radiuses are very important. So the properties are luminosity, temperature, mass, radius, size. So there is a whole process I've been explaining. If you finish fusing, fusing hydrogen into helium, the cores can no longer maintain the main sequence. They become larger and redder. And then they start either becoming a giant and super giants. Most of the stars the size of the sun or smaller, after fusion has ceased, and they collapse after being a giant, will become a white dwarf. A white dwarf is the final stage of a means of a star, of a low massive star, of a small star. That won't happen with giant stars. The main characteristic of a white dwarf is that it's made of what we know as the fifth state of matter, fifth or sixth. Yes, here we're talking about the exotic, exotic state of matter. Then we're gonna answer that question, all right? Or I'm pretty sure you know it's pretty easy. Uh, uh, solid, liquid, gas, plasma, neutron star, white dwarf, black holes. Believe it or not, those last three that I mentioned are also exotic states of matter. They are not gas, they are not solid, they are not plasma. In the case of white dwarfs, they are what we call electron degenerated matter because of how pressure works to make that happen. Um, it has to do with chemistry and I will go and try to explain that, but there is something called in chemistry the Pauli principle. And it has to do with the, when you do the electron configuration of an atom, I remember that two electrons can not occupy the same quantum space, the same orbital space. But because you are squishing matter with that enormous amount of pressure, the Pauli principle sort of breaks. And you, that's when you start having that exotic degenerated matter. So, that is white dwarf. Neutron stars are neutron degenerated matter. And black holes are its own thing that we will talk later. All right? So there it is. All right, what's the answer for this question? Which star is most like our sun? E. Huh? E. B. E. Good. Which of these stars will have changed the least? 10 million years from now. Be uh, careful. Huh? See? Nice. 
Yes. How do you know it was C, by the way? Because I know the redder it gets, the longer the lifetime. Nice. Good job. Oh, there you are. So it's good. I was afraid that there was too much information today on this. Very good. So yes, the redder you are, the more lifetime. So obviously 10 million years won't be enough for this. This is 100 billion years lifetime. Excellent. Which of these stars can, can be no more than 10 million years old? Ooh. A. Yes. Because of the lifetime. Nice. Any questions? I think I leave this for next class. I want to leave this for next class, the properties, and this is we're about to finish anyway. All right. Uh, set five variables, it's probably going ahead a little bit. That's when we talk about some of the parts, like the horizontal branch for the uh, stars. Just to give you a glimpse, Cephite variables are stars that, which its luminosity changes as a function of time. And we can use that to measure apparent and absolute magnitudes as a function of time. And guess what we can do with that? We can find very large distances in space. So large that we can use Cephite variables to determine the expansion of the universe. We can do that. All right. All right. So that's basically chapter 15. I want to go over a little bit and then I will introduce the lab. I think actually I'm going to go and do the stellar, this lab first, next class. Starlight. So let's unpublish this for now. I want to go and do this. Actually, no, because we only have, that's fine. We can just do this. It's fine. Let's do this and then we do this when I come back. Um, uh, we're going to finish showing you guys this video, all right? It's a nice video where it explains the H&R diagram. Then we can have a few questions, and um, that's it. What I will suggest you guys is do homework on chapter 14 and 15, and we can discuss. Oh, yeah, I have to show you how to do that problem as well. So let's show you this video, and then let's go into that problem. Are we all doing right, a guys. lab today? Huh? No, we're doing, we doing a lab. Okay. Okay. All right. Welcome to High School Physics Explained. How do we know so much about stars, even though they are so incredibly far away? And so today I wanted to concentrate on a particular aspect of understanding stars, and that is a diagram that is commonly referred to as the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram which is an extremely important diagram that helps us understand a lot about stars. Now, there will be aspects I won't go into. I'll discuss that as we go along, and that will be subjects of other videos. But I particularly want to today want to talk about the HR diagram. Now, before we understand the HR diagram, we need to understand two measurements we can measure from stars. So here is a very famous image, the Southern Cross over here and two stars that form part of the constellation of Centaurus. And we have Alpha Centauri over here and Beta Centauri over here. And then we have the small constellation of the Southern Cross over here. And it's pretty clear that stars have a number of features that are quite available to see. And so first thing that you notice is that there are stars that have different brightnesses and so forth. And some are clearly brighter than others. And secondly, you'll notice that stars have different colors. So this star appears bluer, and this one is stars appears white, and then and this one is a little bit, a bit of a color uh, associated with it. And those are the two features I want to concentrate on that help us understand the HR diagram. That is brightness of a star and the color of a star and the information that we understand from those two things. So let's concentrate on brightness. There's two aspects of brightness, and the first thing is to how bright it just appears. And brightness initially was categorized by a Greek called Hipparchus. And what he did was he classified stars from one up to six in terms of their brightness. So one was the brightest star he saw, and six was the dimmest star he saw. And anything beyond that, of course, he wasn't able to see. And as far as he was concerned, there was nothing beyond the one. And so we had various categories along the way of brightness. 
Our modern technology, of course, allows us to see further. We are now able to go beyond that. So we can get brightness of stars that are beyond six because now we have telescopes to see dimmer stars. So for example, this image here, you can clearly see far more stars in this image than you would naturally, even in the best situation, such as out deep in the country without light pollution. If you were to look at the Southern Cross and saw the pointer stars, as I said, Alpha Centauri and Beta Centauri, you would not see all this detail because simply our eyes aren't able to see that such low sensitivity. And clearly we can go beyond this too. So for example, as Hipparchus looked at the Northern Hemisphere, there are stars brighter than his, or, and so we have numbers that go beyond that. And so we can even have stars that have a brightness of a value that is brighter than one, so even into the negative values. But before we go on, we need to also discuss a different terminology here. And so what Hipparchus is now referred to in terms of his scale of brightness is a term that we know as apparent magnitude. In other words, how bright does it appear? What is the magnitude in terms of appearance? Now this scale is now slightly adjusted based on that the five jumps over here is equal to 100 times brightness. So for example, star that is classified as a magnitude of one is 100 times brighter than a magnitude of six, but that will be a discussion of another video in terms of the details. But the other real big issue to understand is that this is how bright something appears. And in other words, if we look at, for example, these two stars, they appear roughly equally bright. Now, Alpha Centauri has an apparent brightness of uh, 0.01 and Beta Centauri has an apparent brightness or apparent magnitude of 0.61, which means it's slightly dimmer. But the problem is, is that what it doesn't take into account is the distances of these stars. Now, if I were to take a candle and hold it up like within 10 centimeters of your eye, then that candle will appear much brighter than let's say a floodlight that is 100 meters away, even though the candle is inherently less bright than the floodlight. And so we need to adjust this apparent magnitude to account for the distance. Now, to give you a perspective, Alpha Centauri is 4.3 light years. Okay, so in fact, this system here is the closest star system apart from our sun. Beta Centauri, even though it appears approximately the same brightness, is 390 light years away, so significantly further. So clearly, star must be significantly brighter than this one, but of course, the distance screws the situation up for us. So we need to adjust that. And in order to do that, we need to know the distance. Now, I won't go into the specific details of how we determine stellar distances. And in fact, there are two methods for stars that are roughly around 300 light years away and less. We have a system called stellar parallax. And any stars that are significantly further away, we use a way of working at distances by referring to Cepheid variables. But that is a topic of another video and you'll feel free to look that up. And I will probably organize to do another video based on how we determine stellar distances. But needless to say, we have ways of determining distances and therefore we have a way of adjusting the star's brightness to what we call its true brightness or its true magnitude, and we call that the absolute magnitude. So for example, as I told you, uh, Alpha Centauri has an apparent brightness of 0.01, and I told you that Beta Centauri has an apparent brightness of 0.61, and so clearly they look equally bright, but because this is further away, we can now adjust mathematically. Again, this is not a topic of this video, but if we adjust that, we get 4.38 for the absolute magnitude for Alpha Centauri, but negative 4.53 for this one. So this is significantly brighter in reality. So this actually reflects the star's true brightness uh, as opposed to what it appears. So that's brightness for you. Now we can classify stars according to their brightness. However, here is again a Southern Cross, and even in this case, you can even see more resolution and more stars. Secondly, though, we need to look at color. And it is clear that this star is a different color to, let's say, this star. And why is it a different color? Well, color actually gives us an indication of a star's temperature. 
Now, uh, I have a video already uh, where I discuss uh, stellar classification and also one that discusses Wind's law. But we have a way of understanding the temperature of a star by examining the color of the star. And so once we have an understanding of the color of the star, we can determine its temperature. And as a result, we know that stars can have a varying temperature of anywhere between 3000 Kelvin up to 50,000 Kelvin. Now we are talking about, of course, the surface temperature of the star. Internally, it's into millions of degrees Kelvin. We now have a range. We can now classify stars according to their color in terms of the cooler stars and to hotter stars. And the cooler stars will appear redder and the hotter stars will appear bluer. We can then also have a different way of classification. We have a system which is a letter classification. We give a star a, a classification of anything up from a O down to M and B, A, F, G, K and M. And in between we can have an O1 or an O9 and the range and so forth. We can have an F2 star and so forth. And one quick way to remember these letters if you want to is to remember an, a mnemonic that's quite old and a little bit sexist but it's one that's stuck around basically for almost a century and it's basically O, B, A, fine girl or guy and kiss me. So that's a way of memorizing the um, classification system of stars according to their color or according to their temperature. So now we have two things. We have brightness that we classify a star with and its color or its temperature. So now let's start looking at a graph. So here I have a graph. Unlike a normal graph, we're going to actually have two sets of y axes and two sets of x axes. And the first thing we have here is magnitude and that is specifically the absolute magnitude so a star's true brightness and as you can see we start with really dim stars down the bottom to really bright stars up the top because the order of the magnitude is that the bigger the number is the dimmer it is we're following hipparchus's initial classification system now we could also do that in terms of luminosity now luminosity now that energy a star releases and it's obviously related to brightness, though there is a slight mathematical difference between the two. But nonetheless, we can classify a star. So our star, our sun, is approximately 4.3 in terms of magnitude. And so what this does is this number rep one represents the luminosity of the star compared to our sun. And so as we go up, you can see we have we classify stars that are 10 times more luminous than our sun, 100 times, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and so forth down here. What you should automatically see that this scale is not a linear scale. It's a lot what we call a logarithmic scale. And so rather than going up in additions, we actually are going up in multiplication. So it's a logarithmic scale. So clearly stars that are negative six uh, in magnitude are significantly brighter than our sun or significantly luminous than our sun. That takes care of the y-axis. What about the x-axis? Well, down here we, of course, have the stars according to their classification from O to M. And up the top, we have a similar scale that tells us the temperature. And again, what you'll notice is that it's not a pure linear scale. We have down this end hotter uh, stars and down in this end we have cooler stars. And up the top, of course, we have brighter stars and then the bottom we have here, if we go via the y-axis, we have dimmer stars. And clearly, of course, if a star is hotter, it's going to be generally brighter as well. Um, but as we'll discuss in a moment, um, there are other variables that determine the brightness as well. So what happens if we start to plot stars according to this scale? So what do you see? In this case, I've plotted various points to represent stars that we have classified in our local area of our galaxy. And this is not particularly accurate, obviously, but it does represent what we do get in terms of stars. And the first thing you'll notice is that the majority of the stars seem to fit on this line. In fact, 95% of all stars fit on this particular line. We call this the main sequence, this almost classic S shape uh, of stars. So what does that actually tell us? Well, so over here, 
we have stars that are not very bright and they're also not very hot. So clearly uh, they're also quite small. They're not big stars. If we go up to the top of the main sequence, these stars, well, they're very bright, clearly. But secondly, they are also very hot. And as a result, because they're bright and also they're very hot, we know that these stars generally are large. The other thing, of course, too, to remember is that these stars being hot and very bright, they are undergoing fusion at a really great rate. And so generally speaking, their lifespan is measured in 10 to the power of seven years. So they don't last that long, which also explains why we find fewer stars up in this range than we do down here. If we go down the scale, these stars have anywhere up to 10 to the power of 11 lifespan. So we're talking about 100 billion years here, they could survive. So it's clear that being smaller and obviously going through fusion at a lower rate because it's not as hot, these have a longer lifespan. Now our sun sits approximately here in the scale. So it's a G-class star. It's a G2 star, in fact, and of course its luminosity is equal to 1 when compared to our, our sun. So that's the main sequence. But then we have these stars over here and these few stars over here. What do they represent? These guys are clearly not hot stars. They're cool stars. But they are very bright still. In fact, their brightness is equivalent to some of these blue stars over here. So they're still very bright. What would contribute to the fact that they are cool, but also very bright? Well, obviously what that means is that they are very large. So these are, we often we call the giants. Now, in fact, you can go further into that. We have actually these ones here, which are called the super giants. And then we have here who are the giants. Over here, we have stars as well. But in this case, the star is extremely hot, uh, but it's not very bright. So it's very hot, but not bright. Why is that? Well, they must be very small. So these stars are what we refer to as white dwarfs. And white dwarfs are extremely small. Now let's give ourselves a bit of perspective to help us understand that. So let, what about these large stars over here? Well, here is an example of the large star. And so Rigel is a blue giant. It's a B-class star, B8 in fact. It's very hot. Its surface temperature in terms of Celsius is 12,500 degrees. So it's in this range. And you can see that compared to the sun, it is large. What about the giants over here? And again, if we look at the giants, a good example is Beta Goose. And Beta Goose can be found in the constellation of Orion. And it is extremely large. Now, it's an M-class star, an M2. So it's not very hot. 2,800 degrees Celsius or 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit for the American listeners. And its diameter is about 400 times that of the sun. Now, it is very significantly large. If we were to replace the sun uh, with a Beta Goose, then Beta Goose would consume not only the inner planets, but stretch as far as Jupiter. So we're looking at a really massive star here. But then on the other end of the spectrum, we have these guys. And this is an example of Sirius B. It's a white dwarf. It's hot, but clearly it is very small. And and how do we know all this? Simply because we can determine it mathematically by examining the star's magnitude and the star's color or temperature and therefore work out the star's size. So that is the HR diagram. The HR diagram, as I said, y-axis deals with brightness, with brightness up further high and dimmer further down, and temperature with the hottest at the left hand of the scale and coolest in the right hand of the scale. If you plot all the stars that we have in our local area that we can measure, we find that 95% will sit onto this area called the main sequence, with a few sitting in the giant's phase and a few sitting into the white dwarf phase over here. I hope that's helped you understand the HR diagram. Thanks for watching. All right, guys. So. Let's put the audio properly. Um, 
the videos in modules. It's uh, basically the summary of what we did today. Um, let's go into this exercise so you guys can start working on this. Um, Okay, so this question, the reason why some of you may have mistaken there was that 11,000 is the approximately temperature of Rigel, surface temperature. If you, oops, that, uh, divide by 11,000, right? So that gives you that, but that's in meters. So I told you that you have to change that to nanometers because the electromagnetic spectrum right, for the visible goes 400 and less than uh, 300 and less will be ultraviolet, 750 and then more will be into the infrared. So what do we get here? That's nanometers. So that's in meters. How do you go to nanometers? You multiply by a billion. That's a million, that's a billion, a thousand millions. So that will be the wavelength. It's on the left, so it was a UV. It was in the UV part of the spectrum. What were you times it by, a million? A billion. A billion, okay. All right, it's a meter has a billion nanometers, 10 to the nine. The mistake here was how you guys convert. So let's review that. The wavelength is 500 nanometers. So everybody did this. Everybody got this right. 10 to a negative nine, 10 square there. How do you find the frequency? Frequency is the speed of light. divided by three over five is point six. How do you divide 10 to the eight, divide by 10 to a negative seven, is 10 to the eight minus minus seven, 15. So then the answer will be six, times 10 to the 14 hertz or six terahertz. So it was more about powers of 10, the mistake, all right? That's how you convert from meters to nanometers. Are you, um, are you multiplying, is that multiplication symbol three times 10? Yeah. To the eight, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, okay. All right. All right, guys. We basically finished chapter 15. So I wanna leave it there for today. I want you guys to work on chapter 14 homework. You can start doing chapter 15 homework. We will review chapter 15 and let's start with the lab and try to finish it next class. All right. Any questions about today?